thank you all for coming. I think uh, this has been a great event. Thank you to the, the uh, uh, people putting this together. I think, you know, uh, something like this, they're always, I think, the most valuable players. Uh, so, again, thanks. Um, so, I, as, as she said, like, uh, I, I'm a math professor during, you know, most of my hours and sort of classically trained in applied math, um, but really interested in football just because through like, my background in playing as a, as a younger person and, and just kind of as a fan. And, you know, I, I tried to think about ways in which I could integrate myself in there. Um, and I, it was also one of those times where data journalism was really, you know, sort of starting to, to get its legs. And so I ran into a website called Pro Football Focus which I at the time considered data journalism because they were using you know, some of our, our grade data to try to you know, write articles and, and make stories about how the NFL was working. Um, and so I, I decided to sort of latch on with them. Um, and just a, a little bit of a background is Pro Football Focus is a company that was originally, originated by uh, a gentleman named Neil Hornsby uh, in the UK. And he was you know, very unsatisfied. If you meet the guy, he's, he's one of those people that's always poking and prodding at like conventional wisdom. Uh, and he was, he was a little bit like taken aback by the fact that like our traditional statistics, you know, can often like mislead us, right? So something, for example, like tackles for a linebacker or safety, like whether you make that tackle at the line of scrimmage or whether you make that tackle 15 yards downfield is clearly a different outcome as we, we saw in an in a earlier talk today. Um, but we often just give that person a tackle, for example. And um, so, uh, over the years, it, and it's certainly been an evolving process, but PFF has developed a system to grade every player on each play of each game. Uh, and we currently have, you know, 29 of the 32 teams have contracts with us, um, which, is, you know, more or less is us having, you know, 11 years of NFL uh, data as well as three years of uh, Division One college football uh, in our database. And then about three years ago, Chris Collinsworth, who is the... Um, color commentator for Sunday Night Football, uh, bought the company, and now you know that's kind of brought in an infusion of resources for us, and also some exposure. So this is a preseason game from uh, last year. This is it was on NBC, and notice the, the pro football focus position grades were there. So we've sort of gotten our way into uh, uh, it's kind of the mainstream of the NFL in a relatively short amount of time. Um, and yet, we still have have not done a lot of stuff in terms of analytics. Um, and, and, you know, so when I started to actually, you know, in, in our analytics wing, I thought to myself, there's a lot of things that other people do, and they're not armed with our data, and could we do a better job at least supplementing these things with the information that we have? And so I thought immediately, back to my kind of my data journalism love here, I went to the 538 website, and this is from the beginning of last season, looking at, uh, and what I really wanted to emulate was this, was this ELO rating, which is basically a rating that was, gener that was created by this gentleman named Arpad ELO um, for chess players, and it's been applied to other sports. But basically this idea is it's a, it's a rating system where you can compare teams based upon you know, schedule adjusted and, and time adjusted uh, uh, metrics. And so last year, notice, not perfect, right? Carolina and Denver didn't even make the playoffs last year, so this is clearly not the best, you know, beginning of the season rating. Um, and and so, but then this brought me to like kind of a broader question of like, how do we even evaluate the strength of teams, and why do we want to do that, right? So here are a couple reasons why you should develop a rating system, right? So to, true team strength relative to outcome-driven realities. Okay, so you could have a team, um, you know, the the classic example was in you know, the, the book or the movie Moneyball when the A's were, you know, 10 games below 500, but all of their metrics were pointing them in the right direction, so they stayed the course instead of selling off their players, right? That kind of thing. You could, you could better understand how good your team really is versus, uh, you know, versus, like, what your record is at the time. Um, predict future performance and help develop long-term strategies. Um, adjust metrics for opponent strength. So one of the things that Pro Football Focus that we don't do uh, with our grades is adjust them for who you played when you earned, you know, so if you had four sacks and ten pressures against the worst right tackle in the league, we don't do anything to adjust uh, that for who, you know, who you play. Um, and then, like, overall player valuation, right? Just sort of trying to, you know, either with our team clients or with the public, try to tell people sort of how valuable players are. And then predict games, right? This is kind of fun, right? Um, so whether it's against the spread 
over under money line, um, and then predict how seasons do. And then I think it's just kind of fun, right, to to be able to uh, go back and, and and look and say, oh yeah, the Detroit Lions weren't actually that good last year, right? And and they just did hit a string of good cards, basically. And so the first one that I'm going to start with is this Elo method. As I said, there's this guy named uh, Arpad Elo who developed this uh, method for. Uh, chess, and then Nate Silver 538 was the one that I originally saw with this uh, ELO metric on his website. Um, and you know, you what's really nice, what, the thing I like about ELO is it's kind of it like it projects from season to season with a, a little bit of um, regression to the mean, but you can kind of look at how you know a team has played throughout sort of their history here. And so, that, for example, this is the New England Patriots. And you look about average is about 1505. And they've been uh, profoundly above average team since Belichick has been their coach, which we all sort of know. Um, and so the, the characteristics of the ELO method is that it's iterative. Okay, so you have your ELO score now. You take the ELO score of your opponent. You come up with what should happen. You find out what does happen, and then you update the ELO scores accordingly. Okay, and that's um, and that's basically can be you know sort of summed up in this in this equation here. So. You know, N plus one, N, is N being weeks, team I, if you're playing team J, you have these ELO scores that uh, are, are prior to the game. You actually have the score of the games, the, the game that occurred. You compare that to what should have happened, the expected score, and then you basically update. And there's a couple parameters there that tell you like sort of how much to update if, you know, for example, the Browns were to beat the Patriots, right? How, much, how sensitive is the rating system to that kind of random, you know, that random type of game, or if, you know, uh, two teams, you know, that are relatively of equal strength, if one blows out the other, how much to adjust the, the metric there. Okay, so there's a lot built in here, but, you know, sort of with a really, you know, kind of wide-varying audience, I sort of left that out. Um, and so, you know, just kind of reverse engineering what ELO had, the regular ELO ratings had from last year, this makes a decent amount of sense, right? You have New England first, Atlanta second. And then it kind of gets weird, right? Kansas City third, even though they lost to Pittsburgh twice last year. Um, Green Bay, you know, and again, this being iterative, it kind of, it, it washes out some of Green Bay's struggles in the middle of the season. And when they come on strong at the end of the season, it sort of really doubles down on that. Seattle, similarly, Dallas, and then Denver didn't make the playoffs, but they were a relatively strong team in a strong division. So uh, that, that's not too... Um, Offensive, and then of course the, the worst teams in the league here. Uh, one that's interesting is that San Diego, I think, is actually quite a bit better than 27th, um, but that's where they, they're at there. Uh, they're certainly, I think, better than the New York Jets. Um, and so the question is, is how can you how can you kind of build upon this? Um, because football is profoundly discrete, okay? So you don't get win shares. You don't get 45% of a win if you lose by three, okay? And there's obviously fluky things that happen, right? So uh, the ball bounces off the upright, and whether it goes into the, into the goalpost or out of the goalpost is the difference between a tie game or a or the Chiefs winning against Denver in, in, in Mile High last year, for example. You, know, you just have weird things that happen in football. And so uh, my hypothesis is that you know we have PFF grades that I think both track well with how somebody's done, but also can kind of differentiate uh, between when a team won luckily or won profoundly, okay? And so one clear example that I like from this and sort of digging through the data, um, last season in Detroit, the Lions on, a, on the strength of an Anquan Bolden touchdown beat uh, Washington by three, okay? And using our grades, actually Washington like sort of outgraded, uh, and this is basically using all of our grades with a machine learning algorithm, um, outgraded Detroit and won by two if you just looked at how the grades constituted themselves, which kind of seems like a silly game, but if you if you follow the NFL at all, you know that this would have flipped to the last playoff position in the NFC last year between from Detroit to Washington. And, you know, they probably both would have gotten blown out by Seattle, but who knows. Um, and, and sort of that's what that's basically what the PFF LO system does is it is it takes the grades it re it redoes the game and says what would have happened if we just would have used how the players played uh, as a proxy for the game the, the game score and one of the things I like to look at is the NFC North here where you know kind of qualitatively these both kind of look the same the Vikings started out really well as we all know and then started to suck the the Packers were fine at first started to suck and then got pretty good the Bears always kind of suck and then. Um, and then Detroit, 
you know, you, they, you kind of, again, qualitatively speaking, like, it, it's kind of what happened. They were kind of a middling team, and they had a little surge where they were winning a bunch of last-second games, and then, right, they lost their last three regular season games and the playoff game, uh, and in many cases quite convincingly. And, you know, if you look at our PFF LO, right, we kind of have the same thing, except for Detroit never graded well or played well, really, you know, both from a defensive standpoint but all, also components of their offense. And so we actually had them as a below average team most of the season. They did spike up here for a little bit, but then by the time the season was over, like it was actually a more of a foregone conclusion that they would suck in the playoffs than if you just looked at their game by game grade, uh, game by game scores. And so this is just one example. If you look at uh, just the, how they're rated, you know, the entire league, um, notice here Pittsburgh overtakes Kansas City, which makes sense because they beat Kansas City both in Kansas City and uh, in Pittsburgh, Dallas is ahead of Green Bay, which I think uh, if you look at the season relatively as a whole, that's probably a little bit more appropriate. Um, Seattle, and then you have Arizona here, who actually really graded well on our system. And if you remember last year, Arizona lost like three or four games based upon uh, just the kicking game. And so that, that, you know, I think this isn't offensive either. Um, San Diego moves ahead of the Jets here in this ranking. I still think they're a little under, undervalued uh, in that regard. Uh, for PFF LO. Okay, so that's one method, and again, you can see how using our grades kind of gives you a different flavor of what actually happened. The next method, um, this is actually kind of interesting, so James Keener is also a mathematical biologist. I met him in a completely different setting. He's a fantastic guy, so we have one thing in common. Um, and so this is, no, only a couple people back did that. I use that every single time, but it's almost never funny. Uh, so the Keener method is a matrix-based approach. So instead of, instead of taking grades and updating them week by week, you basically look at the swath of a person's schedule, the entire, uh, or not a person, a team schedule the entire year, and apply win shares. And so, for example here, this is one of my favorite games. The Kansas, when the 2014 Kansas City Chiefs beat New England on Monday Night Football, the Chiefs were awarded about 85% of a win, and the Patriots were given about 15% of a win. Um, and then these shares populate a Keener matrix. So I'm just going to show you a small, a small subset of the Keener matrix here. This is just for week one of 2016. And the reason I like this is because, you know, Baltimore is the third team in alphabetical order. Uh, Buffalo is fourth. Baltimore beat Buffalo 13-7. And so in the third row, you give about 75% of a win. In the fourth row, you give about a... 24% uh, of a win, and then again, this is in the third column and the fourth column. So you can kind of see what that what happens there. And then as the season progresses, you fill this matrix up with with the numbers that correspond to how the teams played against each other. And what's really cool, okay, you get this 32 by 32 matrix. It's a completely positive matrix. So if anybody knows some linear algebra, you know that if you want to solve, for example, an eigenvalue eigenvector equation. There's this theorem called the Perron Frobenius theorem that says you can. Okay? And, and not only can you, the end result is a ranking algorithm, a ranking vector that makes sense, in that every ranking is positive and they're in successive order of strength. And the way that you sort of compute that is just, I think, by sort of basic linear algebra, <laughs> saying that your ranking is a linear combination of the rankings of the teams you faced and how you played against them. Okay, which makes, I think, a ton of sense and really cool that we have linear algebra at our disposal there. Um, and so what, and so you can just scale these, these rankings to, to, to basically have a max of 100 and you get um, a different rankings. So uh, the, this ranking to the left here is just using points for and against, and the right, as you can imagine, is using PFF grades in, many, in much the same way uh, as I did for ELO. And um, here you get a little bit so the, the Keener rankings really have teams like Denver, Philadelphia, Oakland um, kind of highly ranked because, and you know, this is a, one of the flaws in the algorithm, Philadelphia beat Dallas in the last game of the season. They also played really well against Dallas in one of the games. And then Philadelphia also had a win against Atlanta. You know, so there are reasons why. And then, and then this does not uh, penalize for those wins being earlier in the season. So um, Philadelphia is still ranked highly, even though some of their sort of impact wins were kind of early to, well, and then their last win again was against Dallas in week 17. But anyway, if you just look at our grades, um, notice here that Denver falls down a little bit, Atlanta rises up, but you still do have Denver, um, 
uh, Philadelphia, Washington, grading, you know, probably a little bit better than they should. And I think that's a product, again, of the Keener ranking system, where it's not iterative. It's, it just looks at the entire season as one entity. Um, on, and you can, there, you can go in and make some adjustments that can, that can mitigate that, but nonetheless. Just to clarify, the difference between the two is that the Keener method just uses the actual scores at the end. The Keener uses your, your grades, grades of the players combined somehow. That's right. That's so you, you just throw different. that all, yeah, you just throw them all in and, and use a learning algorithm to say how much, what, what should the score have been given those grades? Yeah. Yeah, but they're both, they're both in, the, in, the, in the currency of scores of a game at one point. It's just that how the scores happened were either I got them from the scores of the actual game or I used the grades to okay. compute them. Yep. Good question. And then here are the, and so if you're a San Francisco, New York Jets, LA, or Cleveland fan, this is going to be a rough talk for you because they're basically bad at every single. Uh, ranking, although they, they kind of get shuffled a little bit here. I like the fact that the Jets were lower in our rankings than uh, in the others just because the Jets were really bad last year. Um, <laughs> and, I, and, and so we all like math that confirms our bias, don't we? Okay. Um, and so one of the things that I like uh, about this is that, okay, is that you can, um, is that you can basically look at you know, Keener rankings versus PFF Keener rankings, and look at teams that played better than their scores would indicate, and maybe look at that as being a, uh, a, a means by which a team can regress or revert to the mean. So in 2015, notice Atlanta and Dallas, even if you look at Oakland, um, Detroit, Chicago, they all played better than their, their scores would suggest. The Jets, Indy, and Jacksonville, all teams that regressed, they they score, their, their games were luckier than their grades would suggest. So that's something interesting. So if you look at this year, teams that might, um, teams that might have a bump would be like Washington, Carolina, San Diego, and then New York and Detroit might be teams that go down. All right, lastly, and I'm uh, you know, running a little short on this one, but the Massey method, this is, uh, this is Massey, and, and, he, and his rankings are in the NCAA. Uh, some version of them are in the in NCAA uh, uh, ranking algorithm for the, the bowl games. And so again, this is another matrix-based approach. Um, the only difference is that the strength of the team now goes, it's not, a, it's not an eigenvalue eigenvector equation, the strength of the teams goes in this, in this uh, vector f. So for the regular Massey rankings, it's basically points for versus points against. For us, well, I'm just going to put scaled pro football focus grades there and see what happens. What's really cool about, and, and and basically, the Massey matrix, instead of having shares there, they just have you know, whether you played a team or not. So those who cancel out when Baltimore played uh, uh, Buffalo. And Baltimore won by six, Buffalo lost by six. So that's F there in the regular Massey ranking. And so this is the regular Massey ranking. They're of a different scale because I don't make points for and against for this one. But again, I'm just looking at offenses. Atlanta, New Orleans, New England makes sense. For the pro football focus version, I'm just using defense. And again, this kind of points us in the right direction. Denver, Houston, New York Giants, Seattle, Baltimore, all you know, fantastic defenses a year ago. And so just to kind of finish up, that was a little bit too, too brief, but just to finish up, um, one of the things that you can do with this is because we have play, player grades, we can pull players out of the system and see how their team would have done without them and come up with some sort of wins above zero graded player or wins above average. And what's really nice is that when you do such a thing, these rankings sort of make sense. Okay, for one, they sum to zero, and two, you know, the best players in the league at the most high impact positions in the league are amongst the highest <laughs> players there. Notice Aaron Donald is just so amazing that he happens to make it even though he's uh, an interior defender. He's almost a win above average. Um, just a couple like sort of uh, how do these things predict things? Um, PFFLO actually predicts one season's wins better the next season than regular LO. So our grades are a little bit more predictive in terms of how a team will do coming from season to season, which sort of makes sense given the sort of regression to the mean of fluky random things and maybe the more the higher stability of things like player performance. Um, in terms of win percentage, LO and PFF LO basically have the same area under the curve, but if you look at combining all these ranking algorithms together, you actually get an area under the curve of about 72.5, and uh, if you pull out 2016 data, refit the model, and test it on 2016, you win about you get about a 68% win percentage, which 
which is, you know, not 70 is kind of like the really the goal, but 68 would have been quite, you know, one of the top last season. So that's pretty cool. Um, if you look at sort of other things, um, what's really interesting is that these metrics can explain the, a, a substantial amount of the variation in the Vegas spread. So if you just look at like. You know, I like to think of like if the if the odds makers are using a hundred things to make the Vegas spread on a daily basis, we've kind of hacked seventy four of them. Okay, so and given how much sort of human humanness is in the Vegas spread, um, that is pretty impressive. If you put all of these rankings together in just a simple linear model, you get all the way up to eighty percent of the variability in the Vegas spread just from these ranking algorithms. Just from these ranking. Uh, things. And then Vegas over-under is a bit tough, so Massey does a decent job because it splits up between offenses and defenses, and you can imagine that's more important to the over-under than just total team strength, because you can be good by being Denver in low-scoring games, or you can be good by being Atlanta in high-scoring games. Um, and if you put all these together, you can get that up to about a 46% explanation of the variance in the over-under uh, uh, for the uh, Vegas mark there, uh, week to week. And so, um, just to conclude, uh, we examined three ways of rating NFL teams, both using just our points and then using PFF grades. Um, in some instances, the PFF versions were, were uh, more predictive. What I thought was really interesting is if you use something like you know, a dimensionality reduction like PCA, um, even though there are quite a few of these rankings, so there are um, 16 rankings, you need half of them to explain 95% of the variance. So they're each kind of pointing in a principal component that has its own information attached to it. And then if you want 99% of the variability, you need three quarters of those rankings. So again, they're, they're, they're not all just correlated together, which I think is really nice. One of the things to note, on, none of these include roster updations, right? So when a, when a team is missing their quarterback, this will not consider that in the analysis. So obviously any model that is going to try to predict games against the spread or straight up or whatever is going to need some component there. I think our models perform pretty well within that restriction, right, of not having any roster updation. But uh, obviously, if you're going to try to actually pick games or actually pick games against the spread, you're going to want that uh, in your model. And then all the models I reported were, were simple linear models, but we mostly use deep learning models and, and things like that to, uh, to, to fit these things. So even even then, like they're just harder to explain, you know, than to report. So I just didn't use them in this uh, talk. And so, just to kind of acknowledge again, thank you all for coming. This is uh, these are the kind of people who either pay my bills or help me with things. Um, and uh, Chase was was kind of instrumental. He was the editor of PFF for a couple of years that let me like kind of publish a lot of this stuff, which was kind of very instrumental in the kind of the motivation for doing a lot of this. So, thank you.